eternal God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful words of life. Words so sweetly spoken. Words so fitly spoken. The Logos that brings us to you, that created all things. We thank you for your word. We ask you today, God, in the name of Jesus, that as we look to you now to hear from you, that you would speak to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hide your servant behind the cross. Hallelujah. Let there be less of me and more of you, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I see this passage of scripture and I was thinking on it last night again. What a great communicator Jesus was as he spoke to his disciples and the people who would gather to hear him. Such wisdom with which he spoke these parables and these stories that Jesus would tell so he could bring home the message to the hearts of his people. We're going to read from verse 13 to 16. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all there, arose, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. We are still on the journey that leads to wholeness. Hallelujah. And on that journey, we realize that This journey begins at a place in our lives called reconciliation. Because something devastating happened before. God created man, placed him in a perfect environment. And man through his self-will and his selfishness lost all of that. We realize that self-will is self-destructive. When we want everything our way and when we want it, instead of wanting it God's way and how he wants it. We get into trouble in our lives, in our private lives and in our public lives because this was how we wanted it. We never asked God, Lord, how do you want it? What do you want for me? We are afraid of God saying no always. We don't want him to say no because this is the way we want it. And this is what we want. We don't want him to say no because we want it now. We want it now. And we realize that people who are self-willed are selfish. And I don't want you to, to think that 
some love is being selfish. You ought to love yourself. Because the Bible says that in the golden rule, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the way you love me tells me how much you love yourself. So God is okay on you loving yourself. What God does not want you to do is to think of yourself more important than everybody else. He wants you to be kind. And he wants you to love your neighbor. And when you love your neighbor, there is no room for selfishness. Selfishness is sin. Selfishness causes loss. Because the Bible says in the book of James that that's one of the reasons our prayers are not answered because we pray selfish prayers. We pray so that we may heap up stuff on ourselves. You see, whatever God gives you, you must always pray that what he gives you will be a blessing unto others. Amen? That's all you want to pray. Lord, when Jabez prayed the prayer, he says, Lord, expand my borders, but keep me from the evil. Part of that evil is, Lord, don't make me selfish or self-willed with what you have bestowed upon me. But let it be a blessing, not only to me, but to everyone around me. Selfish people are lonely people. Because self-will and selfishness separates us from people, not in a good way, but in a bad way. So these are the manifestations of sin in our lives, and we as Christians, and we're talking to Christians, because the Bible calls this man a son of the Father. You are a child of the Father, but this child of the Father is was a bad Christian. He was a self-willed Christian. He was a selfish Christian who sits in church every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, hearing the message. But there is no application of the word in their lives. Having a knowledge of the word but there is no practicality. There is no practice in their lives. Know the word. Can quote it verse by verse. But that is not what matters. The Bible says you should not only be a hearer of the word, but you should be a doer of the word. You should apply the word. So, being self-will is a manifestation of the original sin of man, the sin of disobedience. Being selfish is a manifestation of the original sin of humankind, the Adam. And it's part of the Adamic nature, selfishness. 
And so those two things result in separation. Separation from God the Father. Separation from relatives and friends. Separation from community. The seven re relationship from the Father. This is what happened to the Son here in Luke chapter 15. The Bible says, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey, not next door, not in the village next to his village, but he went to the city. And I was thinking about Jamaica this morning as I thought about this passage of scripture, how people in the country are afraid of Kingston. They don't want to go to Kingston. Because Kingston has violence and the pace is fast and they can't cope with all of these things and they are deathly afraid of going into the city. I have trepidation for cities. I like to walk between all those tall buildings with things falling down and not knowing when they're going to tumble over on me. I don't want to be there when the domino effect is taking place. So people have trepidation for the city, but there are people who want to be in the city because that's where the lights are. That's where things are happening. That's where the big, luxurious stores are. That's where the pretty buildings are. The city. It's crowded, and, 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 and we get lost in the crowd, and nobody really sees us. So right there, all by ourselves in the big crowd, we are Mr. So-and-so and Miss -so So-and-so. Nobody knows us. So we get lost in the city. This young man probably had that in mind. The Bible says that he went to a far country. <laughs> I guess he had a horse. He went into a far country, far from home. He doesn't want anything near home. He doesn't want his brother to visit him, doesn't want his father to find him, doesn't want his mother to see him. He doesn't want to see his king folks. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the neighbors. He went into a far country. I remember once a friend of mine said to me, he said, man, before I go back home, he lived in Kingston, he said, before I go back home, I take a market truck and go where nobody knows me. He never want to go back to his home. Pride. Pride. A lot of us out here in America, we don't want to go back home either because of our pride. Because what we anticipated has not come to pass in our lives. We take the plane to a far country. <laughs> but we don't want to go back home. So this caused his self-will and his selfishness caused separation between he and his father his mother, his brother, his neighbors, a big separation because he took a long journey far away. My friends, when you and I become self-willed and selfish, 
when we have determined in our heart that we're going to walk in our own ways, we're going to do as we please, we are going to be separated first from God the Father, then from our brethren around us. Some of us are in church every Sunday, but our minds are in a far country. The singer says, your body is here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. And a lot of us drag our bodies to church on Sunday, but our minds and our hearts are far from God. We speak with our mouth nice things, but the Bible says that our hearts are far away from God. Our self-will, our selfishness, sin, has caused a separation between us, God, and the family of God. This is not new, because from the very beginning of time, this was what happened. Nothing new. Man in the Garden of Eden had a direct command from God. said unto man, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of all the other trees in the garden, you can eat. But that one, do not eat of it. Man, humankind, Adam, because Eve's name was also Adam, because the name Adam means humankind. In Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says that God made the man and the woman, and he called their name Adam. One name for the man and the woman. It was Adam who called his wife Eve. It wasn't God who named Eve. It was Adam who did that. God called both he and his wife one name, Adam, humankind. So Adam surrendered the will, submitted it to the desire and it gave birth to sin. That's what happened. It gave birth to sin. Lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, kills you. That's what the Bible says. So lust is desire. So when your desire gets pregnant, it becomes overwhelmed. It gets pregnant only because you submitted your will to your desire. And the birth is going to be horrible. The 
because that gives birth to sin. And sin causes separation between you and God. Sin. Brethren, there is no excuse that we can offer once we have been born again into the family of God. You see, a lot of us take the grace of God for granted because we're saying God is not like he was in Old Testament time when we would be stoned to death or he would open up the ground and it would swallow us up. And we thank God for the death of Jesus Christ. But instead of doing what Jesus says we are to do, we trample upon the blood of Jesus under our feet. Because when we continue to walk in disobedience, when we continue to be self-willed, when we continue to be selfish toward others, then we are trampling the blood of Jesus under our feet. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 says, and if you have your Bible, turn there with me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Genesis 3, 24. The Bible says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This was where God met with man every day. This was where God came in the cool of the day and had conversation and communion with man. But now, man is driven away. You see, God can't dwell outside of the garden. Because that's why the cherubims are there with the flaming swords. They are God's guards. Contained in the tree of life is the Son of God. So man is now driven from the very presence of God. He can't dwell there anymore. That's how you feel when you have sinned. You see, you don't want to sin. Nobody wants to sin. I, 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 have to, I can't say that we are lovers of sin. But what we love is the result of sin. We love the gratification. We look past the action and see what we're going to get out of it. But you know that puts a lot of people in trouble. That's why there is so much murder, domestic violence, all sorts of stuff going on in the world today. Is that people did not look at what they're getting into. They only saw the end result. If I do this, it's going to end up this way because I'm going to end up having this, that, the other. They choose people that have stuff. <clears throat> potential. I see potential in that person. 
What potential? The potential to make us rich. Hallelujah. And they don't bother to investigate the background. They don't bother to meet any relative because this is what they want. They don't bother to ask God his will. This is what they want. Mankind, when Satan said to Eve, you shall not surely die, but God knows that the day you eat of this tree, you will be like him, knowing right from wrong, good from evil. Man did not know what he was taking upon himself. Brother, sister, I would prefer to live in the Garden of Eden, not knowing right from wrong. What a responsibility man unknowingly took upon himself to crave to know good from evil, right from wrong. And all he knew was peace and joy. Gave it up for instant gratification. For a few good moments, he gave up all that was good. Because the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life caused man to lose everything and to separate him from the Father. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 14. Genesis chapter 4, verse 14. Hear what Cain said to God. Cain had just killed his brother because of covetousness. Hear what Cain says to God. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And where? From thy face shall I be hid. From thy face shall I be hid. That's a terrible thing to happen to any human being. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. That's to find yourself in a dark place because God is light. And he saw himself in a dark place, separated from God. No more communion, no more fellowship, but he's in a dark place because he killed his brother. So our prayers are not answered because we pray selfishly. And because we are selfish, and self-willed, we are separated from the Father. This young man in Luke chapter 15 was separated from his Father, and the Father here represents God the Father. The younger son here represents those Pharisees who would reject Jesus Christ.
And so they are separated. There's a separation between God, the Father, and us who are self-willed and selfish. I wish Christians could get it together. All this mess in the world would have to stop. If Christians would just come together and be united for the good and not for evil. People unite for bad things all the time. Then church, they form cliques. And they become united. We're going to fight against that. We're going to fight against that. Come what may. You, and you see them whispering, whispering, whispering. We're not going to put up with that by no means. We're going to fight against that. We're going to fight against the pastor. We're going to fight against his wife. We're going to fight against them. We're going to stand up against them. There's no way they're going to do this or do that. United for the wrong cause. That's evil. Psalm 66, verse 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. I'm working your Bibles today. Psalm 66, verse 18. When you dare say amen. amen. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard evil iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sin separates you from the Father. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And sometimes people do you wrong and the thoughts that come into you, if you're not quick to dismiss it, you know, you get in trouble with the Lord. Because Psalm 37 says, you should not think to do evil to anyone. So that thought that is in you is not of God. To do evil to anyone. Because that thought separates you from the will of God. Look with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, sorry. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 verse 2. When you're there, say amen. Let's read from verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It's not that God does not want to set you free. It's not that God does not want to deliver you. It's not that God does not want to save your boy, or save your girl, save your husband, save your wife, save your community, but your sins standing between you and God like a wall. God is on the other side of your sin. You are on one side. You need to get this like how called prayer. 
and start beating that wall down. And the prayer you have to pray is, Lord, forgive me. Any other prayer he's not going to hear right now. Not until you say, Lord, forgive me. God treated your children that way. You have denied some requests to your children because they were rude, because they were disobedient, because they did something wrong. You say, no, you are not going to have that until you apologize. Here's what God the Father is saying. Tough love. You need to turn around. You need to ask forgiveness. And you need to promise you'll never do it again. So that I can bless you. You have to be in the right place. Your heart must be in the right place. Your mind must be in the right place for God to bless you. And if you are separated from him, he will not hear you. When Abraham uh, uh, was told by God that I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to give you a child. Sarah laughed. Sarah said, this is impossible. I'm old, you are old. We're in our 80s now. How are we going to have children? What are you talking about having a child? I am already ashamed. It's as if God has mocked me because I am a woman and I've had no children, no son to call my own. The other night my son called me and we were talking about obeying God rather than obeying anyone else. Because when God tells you to do something, don't listen to anybody else. Because God told you to do something, you don't listen to anybody else. When God told Adam not to eat of the tree, the Bible said Adam listened to his wife and God said, because you have listened to your wife, because you have listened to a false messenger over me, you're going to have a hard time because Eve's word should never supersede my word to you. Abraham heard from God, but he listened to his wife, and he went to the back, to the maid's quarters, took unto himself his maid as his wife, and gave her a child, and for 30 years, he did not hear from God. It separated him and God. separating he and God. And in order for God to bring the promise to pass, God had to separate him from the child. Because no one must come before God in your life. Nothing or no one, no husband, no wife, no child, no friend. The Bible says that if you do not hate mother and father, wife, your children, brother or sister, you are not worthy to follow me. He's not talking about hatred as we venomously hate, but he's saying you must love me above all these. When your love is so much for me, when you want to follow me so much, 
It's going to upset your wife. It's going to upset your children. It's going to upset your husband because your zeal is after the Lord. And if they want to tear you away from him, there's no way they are able to do it because you're holding on to Jesus. Amen. You're holding on to him. Amen. You're not going to allow no child or anyone to separate you from Jesus. Separation. There are seven manifestations here of sin that we are dealing with in this first part of the series called Reconciliation. Number one is self-will. Number two is selfishness. Number three is separation. Number four is sensuality. Number five is spiritual destitution. Number six is self-degradation. And number seven is starvation. I'm not even going to go into sensuality today. Because that's what happens when you are separated from God. But what we need to take care of today is ask ourselves the question, is there anything in my life that would separate me from God? Is there anything standing between me and God? He still loves you. In spite of everything that is going on in your life, God still loves you. Because nothing can separate you from the love of God. Because he doesn't answer your prayer doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. Because he does not give you the desires of your heart does not mean that he doesn't love you. As a matter of fact, it's because he loves you so much that he wants to use that situation to woo you back to himself. Is there anything standing between you God? Is there anyone standing between you and God? Are you self-willed? Are you selfish? What's separating you? Then you must ask yourself the question. Because when you're separated from God, there's no boundary left for you. When you feel abandoned by God, the devil takes, wants to take over in your life. Then it's going to come sensuality. Sensuality is the gratification of the senses. Or in the or the indulgence of fleshly appetite. That's what sensuality is. The gratification of the senses or the indulgence of fleshly appetite. It is one word, carnality. All of that is one word, carnality. But today, if you feel alienated from the Father, if you feel alienated from God, if because of your self-will and your selfishness, you're feeling alienated from God, he's saying unto you right now, 
common between all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying unto you, come home. Come home. There's room for you. God did not leave you. You left him standing there. Come home. How about it, friends? How about it today? God wants you to come home. God bless you. focusing on this very moment. He doesn't want you to come into church Sunday after Sunday and your heart and mind is in a far place, far away from your body. You know, we, we really pick up things in the world because we want a positive focus in life. To do well, to have nice things, to get along. But God is saying to the church this morning, I am your positive focus. All those other things are just window dressing. Don't be fooled, saints. You have the word to tell you the truth for real. <coughs> Let him be your positive focus. Jesus. The invitational hymn in your hymnals. Number 490.
you're here today and you know that you've strayed from the path that God wants you to tread, then I extend to you the invitation to come so we can separate. That you can become, you can begin relationship with the Father. He's waiting for you to come. If you've never known him, Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he waits with his arms outstretched. And he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far will he remove your transgressions from you. Let us pray. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in spite of our disobedience, which has caused us, O oh God, to want to walk in our own way, which has caused us to want to have our own way and to do our own thing, which has caused us to be selfish and which has caused separation between you and us. You are still stretching out your hand because you are a benevolent God. You are, you are God the benevolent. You are a loving God. You are a kind Father. And you are not a malicious God. You are saying, come. Come, I'm ready to forgive you. Lord, let no one leave this place today until they have come to you. I pray now for your mercy and your grace. And I ask you, O oh God, to be gracious unto us. Do not leave us nor forsake us as we leave ourselves entirely in your care. Saying thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For the closing hymn is hymn number 409. Thanks to God whose word was spoken. Number four or oh nine.
hands for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you peace now, henceforth, and forevermore. God, go in peace, take Jesus with you.